Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildred, and I am your Gaming Monk for the evening. This is Day 18 of the RPG A Day 2019 Challenge. Today's word is plenty. Well, since I've hinted at this one a few times in the past, I realize that's a running theme throughout this series, but it is what it is. Let me talk a little bit about the open gaming license, and more specifically, what I've referred to as the D20 Bubble. Now this bubble is kind of, but, almost, but not as bad as the speculator bubble that happened in comic books in the 90s. It's a period that I go roughly from 2000 to about 2005, 2006, where everybody and their mother, their mother's uncle, their mother's uncle's brother, their mother's uncle's brother's cousin, and their, and their in-laws, respectively, we're putting out some form of D20 book because of the open gaming license allowing them to make basically products using D&D's D20 system without um, without having to do, without having to deal with much blowback. And while this did result in a few good things, Pathfinder, arguably, Fantasy Craft, most definitely, Slayer's D20, also most definitely, and know your know your role which was much better than it, sh than it had any right to be. There was a lot, and I mean a lot, of shit. I know I've talked about Sturgeon's Law in the past, of 90% of everything is crap. But the problem was there was just no quality control when it came to it, and because of that, a lot of people got turned off on D20 as a whole, and some people outright hated the D20 system because of this. I was never one of those people, but I did fully acknowledge that the open gaming license had gotten completely out of hand because way too many people were putting out shovelware. If I ever get the chance, I would like to have a dis discussion with some of the people who were involved with pushing that thing forward because I get the feeling they had good intentions, but they um they did not see they did not see the bandwagon effect come into play. And of course, when 4th edition came around, we had the game systems license, which was a complicated mess that only a handful of companies ever ended up using, which is a shame because I would have loved to see what other people had, more people had done with the concepts in 4th edition, but without having to deal with the baggage. I think part of the problem was that there wasn't a system reference document in the same way for the open gaming as there was for the open gaming license. There was just a bunch of scattered notes that didn't make a whole lot of sense outside of what you were dealing with. If they, ha at least with the system reference document, you had a kind of baseline approach of what the game was, so that you so that you had something that you could build on. I think that there's the possibility to do that, just use, say, four base classes in um, in D&D 4th Edition and you'd, be f and you'd be fine, but unfortunately that's not what they went with. But if there's any lesson that was learned from this kind of thing, it's the viability of third-party work. And I think the company that's benefited the most from this is Pinnacle and Evil Hat, even though I have a mixed attitude about fate. But Pinnacle, with the Savage World system, has definitely benefited greatly from this due to the, not just the quality control, but from what I keep hearing, the approachable nature that Pinnacle has when it comes to its partners. It doesn't hurt the fact that you're using a system that was already fairly malleable to begin with. Savage Worlds was meant to emulate um, pulp-style adventure. Unlike the D20 system, which is meant to emulate its own little smor own little smorgasbord of, ide of ideas that have never been fully defined in its current state. And that's probably the reason why some games, when converted to the D20 system, just don't work. Two particularly heinous examples I can think of were Deadlands and Fading Suns. Both of which have their D20 versions listed in the, in the We Will Not Speak of This Again category. 
Same thing goes with L5R 2nd Edition, which has the added failure of trying to accommodate both roll and keep and the D20 system at the same time. And the less said about Big Eye Small Mouth D20, the better. With all, the, with all these, it's very much a case of, tr of trying to either do two things at once or use a system that it's just not meant for. A game like Fading Suns does not do well with the traditional class system. Nor does a game like Deadlands. Now, I suppose with Deadlands you could you could make a bit of a stronger argument. But I am firmly of the opinion that these are games that work better with archetypes than they do with classes. This is also the same reason why if somebody were to suggest a Shadowrun D20... Using that, using that whole open gaming license, I would have said, no, absolutely not, and shame on you for thinking about that. The problem that I've always had with, the, with this, with the open gaming license, is the fact that it put the idea in people's mind that you could use the D20 system for virtually anything. And, as I mentioned before, and I mentioned this in my old blog before I nuked it, D&D, in general, and D20 specifically, is not a universal-style game. It's not even a broad umbrella-style game. Now, what I mean by a broad umbrella is a game like, say, Fantasy Craft. That's not meant to be universal, but it's meant to accommodate as many types of fantasy games as it possibly can. And its, and its malleability is built around that. But D20, on the other hand, was never built with that in mind, and some of the things that other games do, it's always been kind of awkward with, like, say, skills. And I know old school fans will say, but rogues had rogues and monks had their skill list. That's different. I'm talking about unified skill systems that you would see in a game like The World of Darkness, or Shadowrun, or Warhammer, and so, and so on, where these skills are very much linked in with the core mechanic. That's never something that D and D was ever designed for, and when they started to integrate skills, it always felt kind of awkward. To be fair, I don't have anything against universal style games, but if I'm given the choice between a, a system that is tailor built for the gameplay style or the setting, what have you, that it's trying to emulate, or going with a one size fits all package, I'm going to go with the former nine times out of ten. I've got nothing against GURPS, I've got nothing against HERO, I don't even have anything against Cortex Plus. In fact, I loved Cortex Plus. But I prefer tailor-making games for what they are meant to be emulating.